Brian. Thank you, Liz. All right, welcome everyone. And I can see lots and lots of uh, viewers rolling in. So don't be intimidated, Brian, but you have a, you have a big audience. Um, this Thursday's lecture is actually not just a Crow Canyon webinar, but part of the Four Corners lecture series. The High Satsunome chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society is, uh, is presenting our, um, our webinar today. So on their behalf, I'm just going to go ahead and, and get us started with some intro slides. Uh, I'm Liz Perry, president of Crow Canyon, and we start all of our meetings and webinars with our acknowledgement. Uh, of the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our campus here sits and where we work and live. Our mission-related work, uh, just as Brian was saying about his work, would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. We are truly grateful to all Indigenous people, and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands which rolls right into our mission, which is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through our three pillars, uh, the tools in our toolbox, archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Please check out our website at crowcanyon.org for more information. And thank you, everyone, for supporting our webinar series. It's a free webinar series, uh, but I know how many of you donate when you sign up and register for the webinars, and we are so grateful. The series is entirely supported by donations, and um, you are all incredibly generous, and we are so grateful to help us continue to put these on and uh, compensate our scholars and our, our hardworking staff. Uh, just a quick Zoom reminder, you can grab the black bar next to our heads and move us over if we are too big as compared to Brian's PowerPoint presentation. When you do have questions um, at any time in the presentation, if you could use the Q&A uh, function to be able to enter those, and that way we'll keep track of them and they won't get lost in the chat. Uh, if you have, if Zoom gives you some trouble, uh, just head over to our live stream on Facebook. Uh, and if you miss this or have to run away, you can you can go to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, all of our past webinars there and lots of great videos. Coming up, um, really looking forward to some of these coming up, and I'll be moderating again next week for Dismantling a Legacy of Misrepresentation, Critiquing the Past in Order to Improve the Present coverage of American Indian issues and identity with Dr. Melissa Greenbly. We are really looking forward to that. Uh, and then after that, some of our, our friends um, from Edge of the Cedars cataloging archeological collections at, at Edge of the Cedars uh, with James Willen and our friend, Jonathan Till uh, the week after that. So please keep joining us. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce Brian Bates who we are all very excited about his lecture today. Um, Brian is a teacher and a professor. Um, love, we love high school teachers and also uh, college science professors. Uh, uh, most recently, Brian taught cultural astronomy at Coconino Community College, where he obtained a NASA space grant to create the college curriculum and teach the first ever college level cultural astronomy course west of the Mississippi. He retired as an emeritus science professor in 2016, having taught biology, environmental science, natural history, and chemistry. And he supplements his active life by guiding for organizations like National Geographic, the Smithsonian, um, uh, uh, Beckert Ex Expeditions, and the Grand Canyon Conservancy Field Institute. Brian, welcome, and thank you so much for coming and sharing your work with us today. Well, thank you, Liz. And can I go ahead and share my screen? Please. All righty. Well, Liz, I want to begin by sharing with you uh, and all of uh, the folks that are with us this afternoon uh, about the tremendous depth of knowledge within the Native people. Uh, they observed nature. Uh, they documented different cycles, whether that was astronomical, whether it was with the plants or with uh, rain patterns or climate patterns. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of knowledge there. And I think that uh, it's actually, this presents us, what Crow Canyon is doing, presents us with an opportunity to learn from them, particularly as we enter the phase of climate change and how do we adapt 
how do we change our behaviors, our culture, so that we can be more in touch with the natural world. With that, uh, this afternoon, I'd like to share with you uh, that we're going to, I'm trying to clear my screen. Uh, hold on here. All righty. And uh, basically what I want to do today is to share a, a general overview of how astronomy and science can help uh, different people improve their probability of survival and as well become culturally classified information. And then at the uh, question and answer is to engage with you about how we can better learn from ancestral peoples. So let's see, it doesn't want me to go down. Okay, why am I not moving? I am, hold on here. Uh, let's see if this works. There we go, okay. Uh, so to begin with, here you are, the observer of the sky. Uh, you're looking towards the south and you can watch whether it's the sun, the moon, the stars, you can watch the movement of celestial objects along the, uh, your horizon, along your uh, skyway, and then throughout the year, begin to notice those patterns and how those patterns then repeat year after year. Uh, secondly, that patterning is dependent upon uh, the earth, which you can see here, if you can see my white uh, arrow there, that's the earth at the spring equinox. And the earth moves around the sun, which is the yellow ball in the middle there where it says vernal equinox. And as the earth moves around, it is tilted towards the northern hemisphere, tilts towards the sun during the summer, and then uh, comes through at the autumn equinox through the winter solstice, where now the northern hemisphere is pointed away from the sun. And then we come back to the vernal equinox. Now I wanna make another point here in that if you go halfway or approximately halfway between an equinox and a solstice, you get what we call a cross quarter date. And so that's about half the time between in that migration cycle. And it's a time at which the rate of change of sun motion along the horizon changes. So the rate of change changes. And that's May 1st right here. Then we come around to August 6th. We call that Lammas. They call it Lammas in Europe. Uh, down here where it says ecliptic, that's approximately the time of Halloween or All Saints Day. And then Groundhog's Day at February 2nd. We'll come back to those dates. The other thing I want to make sure you understand is that as the earth orbits about the sun, we have the Earth's spin axis that remains at a constant 23 and a half degrees off of north south or up and down, straight up and down. And this is what's going to drive the change of the position of the sun along the horizon at sunrise and sunset. It's also going to account for the change in the amount of light during the day. And of course, the sun is what we're going around. But then if you look outside of here, that's where the constellations are. Now, this afternoon, I won't speak much of constellations. Uh, if we do a session sometime on Navajo, they are primarily a constellation oriented because they were consistently moving. So they did not have a fixed geographic position from which they could observe the movement of the skies. Now, besides the sun, there is the moon. And to do this very quickly, this is where a full moon may have risen. Let's say it rises here. And this is what we call the northern minimum lunar excursion. And what happens is 14 and a half days later, you'll have a new moon down here. And then 14 and a half days later, the moon will be back at its full moon, but it'll be just a little bit further north. And then it goes a little bit further south, a little further north, a little further south. And this pattern continues. And in about four and a half years, it's gonna be right over top of the ecliptic. That's the pathway of the earth around the sun. And that's when we have our highest number of uh, eclipses. And just as an aside, 
in October of 2023, there will be a nearly full eclipse coming across the Four Corners area. And it's gonna be a great time to uh, learn more about native knowledge of eclipses and their patterning, uh, their observation. Well, the moon continues to move beyond the sun, where the sun is. And at this point, you can say, oh, I get it. This moon is beyond the sun. So we can tell the difference between where the moon patterns may go and where the sun patterns may go. And in 9.3 years, you get to the very northern maximum. And as well, 14 and a half days later, you're at the southern maximum. So we'll go over this again. But the point I want you to understand is that the moon is migrating across the, uh, our horizon in a pattern that is different from the movement of the sun. Well, to go from the minimum to the maximum and then back again takes 18.6 years. And we call that the lunar standstill cycle. Now, what I'd like to do then is to pause for a minute because we have to begin to ask ourselves, how do we know when we're looking at an alignment that could be culturally significant? And the answer begins not at the site, but in the library. That's where I spend a lot of time looking at archeological records, reports, uh, interpretations, go back through the ethnographic record. And I'm asking myself, is there any evidence that was recorded that these people, whomever it is I'm studying, that they actually observed and documented the motion of the sun, the stars, or the moon? The second question is on site. So such as here, this is a solstice marker that is a Northern Sanawa site. It's just south of the Mogion Rim, uh, halfway between Flagstaff and Camp Verde. And we have to ask ourselves, could the observer at the time have anticipated an alignment? And in this case, we think they actually did. This is a, an, an equinox site uh, that is uh, documented fairly well within Hopi ethnography. And then the third question we have to ask ourselves is, does the research indicate how the information was used by the culture that we're studying? It's one thing to say that they observed an interaction, but what information did they glean from that? What is it that was important? In the case of the picture that you're looking at, this is a marking of the Hopi Mamzara women's ceremony. So this is the spring equinox. And as I'll share in a bit, there are Hopi men's ceremonies and Hopi women's ceremonies. That actually comes with this picture, a painting by my good friend, Filmer Kiwanyama. And Filmer, uh, took the Hopi calendar and put it into this painting. Here's the Hopi sun god. And then just above him are the two katsinas, the Ahaha and the Ahole katsina, who are responsible for bringing the sun back from its winter migration to the Southern house to December 21st. And within this, you can see up here at the top that there is a new crescent moon, and there is a full moon. Well, that's important because Hopi ceremonies generally begin with the first crescent of a new moon, and they continue through the full moon, sometimes going beyond it. Now, this northern, this line here is north, going down is south, going east, going uh, to our right is east, to the west. And what happens, I talked about the cross quarter dates. Well, this would be the February 2nd cross quarter time period. And this is May 1st. And the time between that is a women's ceremony. Between May 1st over to August 6th, this is a time of men's ceremonies. From August 6th over to 
October 31st. This is a time of women's ceremonies again. And then we go back to men's ceremonies. Very quickly, uh, this is a Katsina who is praying, praying over the San Francisco Peaks. The San Francisco Peaks is where the Katsinas go. Uh, and what is a Katsina? The Katsinas are essentially the essence of those people who have lived a cultural life amongst the Hopi. And so we have here the San Francisco Peaks, the rainbow along which their spirit travels upon their death. Uh, here is uh, Blue Mana, uh, and she represents or uh, honors all life, particularly animal life. As we come down here, this is part of the Puamu ceremony, the earth renewal ceremony I'll speak about more in a bit. This is Katsina Mana, and this is the Katsina that is blessing the corn, blessing the food, as are these native people here, native Hopi. This is Iototo, and Iototo appears here in the southern uh, at the summer solstice, and again up at the northern solstice. And Iototo is the one who follows the sun around, follows the moon. He is the one that shepherds the sky, if you will. Down here, we have a woman who is uh, going to be married. Uh, this is a Kiva down here. You can see the uh, ladder coming up. And by the way, there is ethnographic evidence uh, from Jesse Fuchs that the uh, chief Kachina or the chief, chief of a society may have looked up through the opening in the Kiva towards the sky and used that as a marker to tell them the timing of different activities during the night of an event. Coming across, we come to the snake dance. The snake dance then changes year from year with the flute dance. This is the flute dance. This is coming into the Lala Cantu. This is a women's ceremony that continues over here as it is the uh, fall equinox ceremony. That then gives way to the men's ceremony known as the Wu Tsum. And so this is the Wu Tsum. And finally, we have the uh, Alaska uh, Katsina. And the Alaska Katsina is the one who guides the sun during the day, uh, during the year, uh, along with Iatoto. So the point behind that is that there is a very detailed calendar within Hopi society. That's part of the cultural aspect that we have to be looking at. I'm gonna start at Mesa Verde National Park where I did research with Greg Munson and Larry Nordby. Uh, as a quick background, prior to 1100, uh, these people, people were living and farming in this area and they raised turkeys and they lived atop Mesa Verde. But around 1200, you had uh, people likely from Chaco that had migrated into the region and they were beginning to build uh, places like this. This is Painted Tower of Cliff Palace. Many of you have likely been there. And so a lot of the masonry is Chacoan. Now, one of the unusual things is that Mesa Verde was largely isolated from some of the other Puebloan cultures. We're not entirely sure what that means. We can hypothesize, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of trade going on between them. Secondly, Mesa Verde was only occupied for about a hundred years. That's a rather short period of time. Now, over here, we have the Sun Temple, and this sun temple uh, was built around 1250. It was excavated by uh, Jesse Fuchs, who many of you know of. It's likely a ceremonial center. And we anticipate that it may have doubled as an astronomical reference point. And here inside, you can see that there are two kivas. These are actually kiva towers. But the question is, how tall were those towers? Now. If you come back over to the painted tower at Cliff Palace, this was built about 1200. And if you look through the window here with the red uh, arrow, 
and you take a measurement, the azimuth or the direction relative to north, that looks straight across the top of this in between those two kivas. And so it aligns with the southern maximum excursion of the moon. And so what Greg, Larry Nordby and I did was that we were looking at this alignment as to whether or not it was accurate and was it culturally significant. I should mention real quickly that Fuchs Canyon is right in between these. So that's about a two mile hike if you were to leave uh, Cliff Palace and go over to Sun Temple. Many of you already know about tree rings, but in case you don't, that is how we control time within archeology. span How do we know where, when a building was built? And the simple answer is that you take a cutting from a live tree, you match that cutting over 20 years with uh, uh, a bore that came from uh, a, a house beam. Uh, you match that one with another mount, uh, house beam with another building beam. And what you can do is you can figure out when a site was built. So if you have 20 um, beams or 20 um, samples of these tree rings and they all say it's about 1200 and then you have two samples that say it was you know 1150 uh, then you know that the building was probably built about 1200 and two of those beams were probably borrowed from another building so that's our time control well why is that important greg munson took a lot of the um tree ring dates and he was the archivist there at Mesa Verde National Park. And he put them, uh, found that they fell into these groupings. And then he plotted it along an axis relative to time. So these are the tree ring dates as a function of the lunar standstill. Now keep in mind that the time between one and two is 18.6 years. So between two and three, that's 37 years and then so forth going across. Now, this is an unusual pattern because you don't usually see straight lines in science. And in fact, my reaction was, well, there's no error bars, there's no statistics, but this gave us an idea. It led us to a hypothesis that the uh, building of these different sites may have been related to the uh, movement of the uh, moon. This is a CAD drawing that Greg Munson did. And you can see the two towers that we're gonna be addressing. And the layout is very, very symmetrical. In addition, right up here, you see the green dot, right up about here, there is this pecked basin. That's this picture here. And that pecked basin is just the right size that you could put a post in there, tie an agave rope, uh, or a yucca rope, excuse me, uh, to it, and then use that as a measuring device. Well, that's exactly what we went and checked out because what happens is here's the peck basin. And if you stretch that uh, yucca fiber rope or tape measure in our case, what you can see is that you get uh, almost an equilateral triangle between A, B, and C. Then you do it to the inside corners and you get an equilateral triangle between uh, A, D, and E. And the same happens with the center uh, from the Peck Basin to the center of the Kivas. And so we believe that this was intentionally constructed in order to provide a specific geometry. And we feel that it was likely done with the, uh, with the use of a yucca fiber rope. Now, there is another hypothesis out there that this was, uh, is an example of the golden triangle or the golden ratio, excuse me. And we, uh, in our research, we don't find that, but that is another hypothesis that's been uh, out there. Uh, this is Larry Nordby. He was the director of archeology span at Mesa Verde National Park for numerous years. He wrote the text on how to tell how a building was built. It's called proveniency. And he's 
teaching me here how to do the documentation. Well, that's very important because it's that documentation then that allows us to establish the time, the process of construction, the uh, um, how sophisticated it was and so forth. Now, in this case, there's me, I'm standing on a plywood board over the, uh, what would be the Northeast corner of Sun Temple. And I am measuring sites, this one to uh, this portal right here at the Painted Tower. And I did a number of these, I'll share them in just a minute. And what ends up happening is that we got a number of sites. Now, I should mention that Greg came back and he measured this same alignment through this window right there. And the angle that he and I got between these two different portals is very, very close together. And they both relate to the maximum excursion, the Southern maximum excursion of the moon. Now, all of you know that you have to have uh, data if you're gonna do any science. And so here, is a structure that I measured from the site that you saw me with the, uh, the theodolite there. And uh, what the declination is, that means uh, how far south of the uh, equator of the celestial equator uh, was the measurement. And then what was the object or the date of the alignment. And all of these are pretty much, they're not astronomical. Until we get down here to the painted tower uh, the moon observation port that I pointed out. And if we were exactly on, it would have been minus 28.00. I got a measurement of 28.08. So that definitely aligns with the maximum lunar standstill. If you go over to the south end of Cliff Palace, some of you may have been there, there is another pecked basin, uh, which shows you the winter solstice. Now, this, this is photographs uh, that Greg Munson took from inside Painted Tower. Uh, Kim Malville uh, at the University of Colorado had suggested that this tapestry here, uh, pictograph, may have been a representation of the patterning of the moon through its 18.6 year cycle. We're not sure that that's true, but that's uh, a hypothesis that uh, Dr. Malbell has made. In addition, this is the window that uh, we took our measurement through. And you can see here where it is lined up. This photo was taken in 2007. And then there are these bars that have small nubbins on them that give us an approximate average of 18.5. So that's very close to 18.6. But if we go back to the archives, which Greg uh, did, Greg found these pictures. And these are on the right are photographs that Greg took uh, in 2007. So there's the window in 2007, the moon portal. Here it is from the inside. But over here, this is a photograph taken in 1896 by McKee, who was part of the uh, National Park Service. And this is a picture taken in 1934. So this building had been standing, then it collapsed and the park service rebuilt it. But what's interesting is look where the uh, lines with the dots that may represent something uh, numerically significant that 18.5 time period, look where it is in the two different photographs. And what's happened is when the Park Service rebuilt this, they moved the window, the position of the window. And so we have to take that into account when we do our research. And that's why you always go back through the archives. Now, the other thing that happened was that we found a photograph of John Wetherill sitting here in the center of Sun Temple. And around him is all of this rock. So the three of us, Greg, um, Larry Nordby and myself uh, all took different places and we came to a, a point in which we said, hey, John Wetherill was sitting right there. And we have now 
a way to look at this. And I estimated the amount of rock that was in here. And using those estimates, we asked the question, would there have been enough rock here to have built these towers up so that they came over top of this wall high enough that they could have been seen from the painted tower. And our conclusion was, no, there likely was not enough rock for those towers to be above uh, to a height that they would have been able to see it. So based upon that, uh, we rejected the hypothesis that the uh, alignment that I've shown you was a significant cultural alignment. But you know, you get three guys together, some of them can figure things out. And so one of the things we did was we uh, looked at Dr. Carla Van West PhD dissertation. And she looked at the soils in the Mesa Verde area and concluded that they could have supported agriculture for about 17 to 20 years. So that 18 year tree cycle that I showed you earlier from the, um, tree ring dates is likely related to soil fertility. So why did I show you all of this if it's not even a culturally astronomy, a significant site? And by the way, it may be, we don't know. But what's the point behind it is that we, you've got to look at what information the culture has and then how the culture used that information. And so we went through the due process and we rejected the hypothesis. That's science, that's part of it. And I will share with you that in my work, about one out of every 30 sites I've gone to, uh, I have concluded that they're intentional astronomical observatories. That said, let's move on uh, to Wapaki. Wapaki National Monument is here by Flagstaff and this is a Kraken Rock Ruins. There's a term that we use in cultural astronomy called herophane. And a herophane means, a hero uh, means hidden and phanos means light. So it's actually a term that means where the sacred light reveals itself. And we could think of things such as the burning bush in the Bible as to when the, the bush caught on fire because those people would never have known it was chemical elements that had enough friction that caused the, it to ignite. So uh, a harafne then is the time at which the light reveals itself. You look here, there's a small window in this wall. That's the middle window. Here's the north window. And then here at a different angle is a south window. And so this is a crack and rock uh, solar calendar wall that I researched. If we step to the west of the wall and look towards the east, you can now see there's the middle window, there's the north window, there's the south window, but look at the horizon. Notice how flat it is. It's very difficult to mark the rate of sun migration rate change along a horizon that's flat. You don't have any reference markers. So what happens, the wall is a reference marker. And so when I went about the research, uh, there are three of these windows. All of them are about four and a half to five inches in width. And they're about 30 inches in length. And all of them point to the horizon itself. Now, the problem with this photo is that I took it 25 years ago and I was looking from the east side to the west. I wish I would have been on the west side looking east. Here I'm on the west side looking east at a sunrise. And you notice that this light shadow line that comes across is gonna change with every day. And as such, it then becomes a calendar. You can tell when the sun's gonna arrive in the corner here, when it's gonna be in the center and when it's gonna leave. So I had a permit to stay overnight a few times out at Kraken Rock. 
And what I did was I got up early. You can see the moon, the sun just barely rising. And I took the picture through the south window on October 31st. And the south window on October 31st has the sun at the same position as it is on February 2nd because of the circular orbit of the earth about the sun. Well, notice where the sun is, right in the center. And those are gonna become important. That's an important date. Second, using the same camera, uh, I took this picture of the middle window on October, excuse me, on May 1st. And this is the uh, May cross quarter date. The sun would be in the same place on August 6th. And finally, the first picture I took was with a different camera through the north window of the summer solstice. And so the sun moves to this point, stays there, and then changes direction. Well, what's the significance of this? Is that if we begin here at February 2nd, there is the Puwamuya ceremony in which in the Kiva, beans are planted, they have a fire, it's warm, there's light, there's water, the beans germinate in the Kiva. And as they germinate, they become a lesson to everyone that the Katsinas help bring back life. So this is the beginning of Puamuya. This is the beginning of the renewal of life. Our Easter is very much related to that. In the same way, this is the middle window and the sun rises through that on May 1st and August 6th. So what happens now is if you look at this landscape out here, it's been cold during the winter. And so if you're gonna be planting crops, you need to wait for the soils to warm up so that they can, uh, the seeds can germinate. The enzymes will actually begin working. So the point behind this is that this is a preparation for planting window. And this window then is a summer solstice. It's part of the Niman ceremony. And what happens is that the sun moves to the center, it sits there. And then when the sun changes direction, then the announcement is made in the Kiva to begin preparations for the Katsinas going home dance. And where are the Katsinas going? Back to the San Francisco peaks. If I understand the ethnology correctly, in Hopi, when one passes away, if they are initiated Hopi, then their spirit will travel through the ground or across a rainbow to a local high point. Not necessarily just the San Francisco peaks. It may be like Navajo Mountain. But the point behind it is that the Katsina spirit go and rest in the peak. And then when do they return? Well, the Niman ceremony begins about 10 days after the solstice. And it lasts for about 12 days that puts you into the monsoons. So in this case, I sincerely believe that the Hopis have connected an astronomical cycle with a climate cycle. If I, as I move on, this is a uh, picture of the, what I thought was the water clan. And I say that because I shared it with six or seven uh, Hopi elders, they all identified as, identified as the water clan. That, of course, up there, that's the French poodle clan, right? At any rate, that's a joke, folks. This is the winter solstice. Well, what ends up happening is that all of the activities that I just shared with you about the wall are related to the water clan. However, Dr. Steve McCluskey at the uh, fourth, no, the fifth Oxford International Conference came to me and said, Brian, good presentation, but that's not the water clan. That's the sand clan. He sent me a document from Jesse Fuchs in 1896 or that time period. And sure enough, in Jesse Fuchs book, it was marked as the sand, as the sand clan. I went back to Alexander Stevens and in his book of the Hopi, Excuse me, that's incorrect. 
It's Hopi journals. That's correct. In Hopi journals, Alexander Stevens says that the sand and the water clan merged. So we were both right. This is a kiva that is near, very, very near the uh, solar calendar wall. And Dr. Harold Colton from the Museum of Northern Arizona, the founder, uh, did the excavation here and found artifacts that he claimed it was a kiva. So now you have a probable religious site very, very close to the solar calendar wall. And this literally is just uh, uh, down a few steps through a cliff to get to this kiva. I'm gonna go next to Chaco. Many of you have been there, but perhaps I can give you a little insight here. First of all, this photograph was taken in 1896. And you notice Chaco is not in very good shape. And in fact, this was before any excavation had started. And this of course was the, the Hyde expedition that was sponsored by the American Museum of Natural History. George Pepper and Richard Wetherill were in charge. That was Richard Wetherill's home. Uh, this was a corral and you all have probably visited this. You likely know that a fellow named Charles Lindbergh after flying across the Atlantic Ocean uh, began flying for TWA but he also began moonlighting for Emil Howery from the University of Arizona to take photographs, aerial photographs of a number of sites across the Southwest. And so to archeologists, Charles Lindbergh is an unspoken hero because he documented a lot of these sites before they were excavated or vandalized. But this of course is after the reconstruction of Chaco. This is Fajada Butte. The famous Fajada Butte, uh, and it's all salt layers from ancestral open oceans. And if you hike around this side here onto the backside, you'll find that there's a rock channel you can climb up and you always send the ranger first. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, he's got the ropes. He's got the key to get through here. And if any of you have been up there, you may know there's a resident rattlesnake that's down here. We get up top and these three rocks, I want you to take your imagination, squeeze those rocks together. Now with your mind's eye, lift those rocks up into this channel right there. You can just barely see it, but lift them in that channel and let them fall. Bam, oops, I went too quick. And what ends up happening is that those rocks split apart. You have channel one here and channel two there. Well, what happens is that a fellow named Andy O'Dell, right here, he, Andy is, was a PhD in physics and astronomy, helped me understand all the astronomy. I knew the archeology. span And between the two of us, well, we drink a lot of beer. But what happens is that we're researching the movement of the moon on this site. The sun had already been de uh, decided on. And so what, happens, excuse me, what happens is you can see the spiral petroglyph here through channel two. That's between rock two and rock three as you look at it. And this photo was taken by Bob Mark from the US Geologic Service. And this picture is taken from the National Geographic. I forget what the date is, uh, but it was several years ago, like 30 years ago. And here's the summer sun, the equinox sun and the wonder sun. What's unusual about the Sundegger site at Fajada Butte is that it's caused by a change in the altitude of the sun, where most of our, but not all, most of our archaeoastronomy sites are related to the movement of the sun along the horizon. Well, what happens is the summer sun is right here. That's the summer solstice. You can see it here. And what happens is over time, that sun dagger moves off to the right as you're looking at the spiral petroglyph. If you were here on um, September 20th, there would be no light marker, but on September 21st, bang, you get a light marker. And then that migrates down to become the left side of the winter solstice. Now, if we get underneath and look up, 
you can see now where this light patterns are coming from. And this photo is by uh, the Solstice Research Project, uh, Anna Safair and Rolf Sinclair. Uh, these are photos that Andy O'Dell took. And one, I wanna point out that there's a spiral right over here that you saw in that previous uh, slide. But now what happens is that these photos are probably about five minutes apart. And what ends up happening is that you get this light dagger coming down right through the center of the spiral petroglyph. And you'll notice, oops, excuse me, that is a nickel to give you some reference to size. Now, some of you know that the middle rock of the three slab site of the solar dagger site, sun dagger site has slipped. And uh, these photos were taken prior to that. Secondly, this picture was taken by uh, the Solstice Project, uh, Anna Safair and Rolf Sinclair. And this was taken on September 21st. If you'd been there on September 20th, you wouldn't have seen it at all. The other thing to point out is that you can see that there's a, a groove right along here, along this outside edge, it comes up to about there. There's a groove that's been carved in there. In addition, there's a groove that's right here. And Dr. Sinclair is a well-known researcher. And when he said, well, Brian, it's the groove there, I looked at it and I said, what groove? What are you talking about? And he says, well, touch it. And I know you're not supposed to touch a petroglyph, but I reached in and I very gently, I could feel it, I couldn't see it. It turns up on photographs, but you can't see it if you're there, it's that shallow. Uh, so that was the, the picture I showed you was the equinox. And this then is the winter solstice where this light band is from the summer uh, dagger, the sun dagger that comes to the center. And this one is the equinox marker. But more is going on because we talked about this moon pattern earlier, the migration of the moon. And so Andy O'Dell and I went back and Andy was standing right here as a reference for you. And we're looking at the moon at its furthest northern maximum point in 18.6 years. And uh, we happen to have a full moon and the full moon cast its light across this edge back onto the spiral petroglyph. And this is the pattern that we saw. So this is uh, the light shadow line right there. That's the light shadow line from the moon. This is glare that's off of the camera lens. Uh, Rolf Sinclair went back and he did the research to mark the position of the moon using the sun in the same position. You can figure that out mathematically. And you'll notice that the light shadow line comes right down through that uh, crevice that we spoke of earlier. Well, if you go to Hopi and many of the Puebloan societies, uh, Puebloan uh, tribes to their ethnography, they spend a lot of time talking about the moon. And if you think about it, the moon is what a lot of us use as our calendar. In fact, the word month comes from moon. And if you think about it, not only in human reproduction, but in reproduction of numerous different species, it's often related to moon pattern, moon exposure as well. Now, I need to share something very quickly because I said I was going to go to Hoven Week. And I have a computer that died on me and I lost a lot of information. So uh, I have to go back at some point and see what I can recapture from Hoban Week, but I lost my slide presentation uh, from, the, from my having lost the computer, uh, from my computer having died. So we're gonna to go to Chimney Rock. I call it the enigma in the sky. Uh, and if you will, the northern maximum moon rises right about here, and it will be right in line in between Chimney Rock on your right and Companion Rock on your left, and it comes over top of these two kivas down here. So what happens now 
is that you can see the same alignment here. This is a photograph that I failed to document. Uh, and in fact, I think I got it from Ron Sutcliffe who has done most of this research. But this is the northern maximum of the moon. One of the interesting things about Chimney Rock is if you look at the archeological records, they found a fair number of large bones there, probably with a deer, maybe elk, uh, but possibly you know, other uh, mammals as well. And if you look at the diets of people, most folks who were building these places were probably eating uh, rodents, snakes, rabbits, squirrels, they weren't eating the large animals. And yet there was a disproportionate amount of that. And part of that work comes from the archeologist that's there in um, Chimney Rock in, uh, what's the name of the springs? Pagosa Springs. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I forget his name. So what ends up happening, Ron Sutcliffe did a lot of this research that I'm sharing with you. But you can see the moon rising right between Chimney Rock and Companion Rock. And this is at a time in which Chaco is beginning to collapse, likely due to repeated um, uh, drought patterns in the Southwest. And this is also from Ron Sutcliffe. He marks the pathway here of the moon at its northern maximum. This is a summer solstice. Doesn't even come close to coming through the chimney rock and companion rock slot. And then this is the uh, lunar minimum. So uh, Ron has done a great deal of this work as have others. And this is pretty much concluded that this was an intentional alignment uh, to, to the moon uh, in order to help restore the power of the priest at Chaco. So let me conclude. Uh, first, I largely use Hopi ethnography for the plain and simple fact that the Spanish and many of the Euro-American settlers have destroyed a lot of the traditional knowledge. Much of that knowledge still exists. And I believe that it is of great value, particularly now as we look at climate change. There is strong evidence that the Pueblo cultures track the movement of the sun, the moon, of the stars, that they use that in terms of anticipating what survival activities, hunting, fishing, uh, gathering, being, gathering uh, foods, uh, and so forth. In my perception, the sun provides you with seasonal time, but the moon can provide you with ceremonial times. And as I said before, Many of the Hopi ceremonies begin with the first crescent of the new moon. Constellations, they are used by the Hopi, but they are only used in very specific ceremonies. And finally, a lot of these places, such as Sun Temple, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as such as Sun Temple, they're likely both ceremony and astronomical observation. But one thought I'd like to leave with you is that I believe that religion and science have the same origin. They both explain that which is otherwise unexplainable. And in that sense, we're not looking at right or wrong. We're looking at interpretation of information from different sets of criteria. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll take questions uh, from Liz as time permits. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, Brian. That is, that's a lot to, uh, to digest and um, many, many questions answered already, I think for me and other people, that was the best explanation of the lunar standstill, which has always confounded me a little bit. So uh, thank you for that. Oh, um, you're welcome. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read. I know you asked us to, that you have a, the, a collaborator, Greg Munson, um, that you have worked yes. with, and and he put uh, uh, some supplemental information in the tech in the chat that I'll go ahead and read as you requested. So Greg says um, there is no current Puebloan ethnography that substantiates observation of lunar standstill alignments. We think that this information is sacred and not to be shared with outsiders, or that it was part of a socio-political system 
that failed and was not carried forward into modern times at the time of the migration. Our research at Sun Temple substantiated the lunar maximum alignment of Sun Temple, but not that the two internal towers uh, were used in that observation. So that was that. Did you want to add anything to Greg's uh, observation there? I would simply like to. Uh, say thank you, Greg. Uh, he was the author, the primary author of the paper. Uh, he's an exceptional researcher and has my deepest respect. So Fantastic. let's move on to other questions because we could get sidelined very easily. I know. So we 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 don't have a ton of time. I'm gonna uh, I will um, uh, pose some, and then Brian, we'll go ahead and send you the entire chat and and the questions so that if we don't get to to all of them, okay. Um, uh, you've got those and and folks can can email you as well. So um, all right, let's see. Uh, Donald Carroll uh, says, uh, Brian, thank you for sharing with us. As you noted, Jesse Fuchs from Jesse Fuchs research from my own opportunity to visit Aztec National uh, Monuments Great Kiva and surrounding area several times. Um, oh, once with a Crow Canyon group. Thanks, Donald. Uh, I noticed, took pictures and researched uh, that Aztec Kiva appears to at least mark the summer and winter solstices with the noon sun coming through the roof hatch and striking the drum vault on one side and the opposite drum vault on the other solstice. Are you familiar with any other research into this apparent phenomenon? I'm not personally uh, aware of other research. I, I do know that the sun comes through that opening vault. Uh, again, the Aztec site was rebuilt. And so uh, we have to take a bit of caution there as, our, as we interpret that. But uh, I think that the, those who rebuilt it followed the pattern of the buildings of that area. So uh, was that an intentional alignment? Possibly. The problem is, confirming that. Right, got it. Okay, um, we've got a question from uh, my friend, uh, Susan Markley, who asks, is it possible that Sun Temple was not finished or par partly dismantled? Uh, if so, that might uh, have an effect on the estimates of the elevation of the structures there. Yes, that is possible that it wasn't finished. Keep in mind, uh, Mesa Verde was only occupied for 100 years. And so that may have been an unfinished uh, structure. An interesting side note, Jesse Fuchs took a lot of the rocks from Sun Temple and mm -hmm. built the visitor center at Mesa oh, Verde wow. in the superintendent's wow. office. Wow. wow, that's really, that's interesting. Um, I think kind of staying on, on some of that same topic, uh, a question kind of, um, uh, asking about, let's see, because I'm sure I think uh, Dr. Lexon is probably on here too. So uh, Donald sort of did a follow-up question that the uh, Aztec solstice events might be in line with the Pantheon in Rome that is found to mark similar events with the noon sun and their research said is, is said part of its aspect is from a north-south meridian and wondered if you thought this gave some validation to Dr. Lexon's Chaco meridian. <laughs> That's a complex topic. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, I think, you know, Steve Lexon has done some excellent research. Uh, he's one who thinks out of the box. Was there a Chaco Meridian? I reserve judgment. I, or shall I just say, I don't know. I've read <laughs> what he has said. I've read what others have said. I find it fascinating to contemplate, but I don't know. So I encourage everyone to continue research. That's always a good. That's always a good uh, recommendation. Um, we have a question from who, uh, someone who's a volunteer at Chimney Rock, and really also appreciated your explanation of the lunar standstill. And asked, in your opinion, why did the ancient people pay attention to the lunar standstill cycle? Well. That's an excellent question. And I think it has to do with uh, watching the skies growing up. I mean, we've grown up, I've grown up inside, right? I live inside except when I'm backpacking or river running, whatever. But the point behind it is that these people lived outside. They were seeing the moon on a very, very consistent basis. 
the moon is likely directly related to the women's menstrual cycle. It's likely related to the reproductive cycle of all sorts of different organisms, and we don't yet understand that. So the point I'm getting at here is that uh, folks in ancestral times are going to be watching the moon and how it's changing places, and is that being driven by something that is um, a one of the related to one of their ceremonies related to some of their uh, perceptions of different gods or uh, people who uh, spirits that may be uh, affecting what happens in their local climates. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So we're, we're just a little over five o'clock and I want to be respectful of, of your time and everyone's. Uh, we will go ahead and send you the, the chat. We didn't get to all of the questions, but there is, I think you'll like the chat. There's just lots and lots of praise um, for your wonderful presentation. So thank you so much, Brian. It was, it was wonderful to meet you and, uh, and to hear your exciting work. Well, thank you, Liz. And I want to thank everyone who attended. Uh, you know this it, this has been a passion of mine and uh, it it is interesting because we begin to understand how different people perceive the natural world and, and i think that that's where a lot of the value is uh, i also want to comment that a lot of the uh people have a lot of the participants have made some very good comments and so i would encourage them to continue reading, continue uh, researching, and perhaps come back and do a presentation with Crow Canyon. So Perfect. thank you very much. And I also wanna thank the Society for Cultural Astronomy of the American Southwest. Uh, it has been my, uh, I have loved working with them. I'm one of the people that helped create it. And uh, our objective is to understand the use of astronomy and the development of science within native cultures so that we may better understand different ways of perceiving uh, the earth that we live on. Wonderful endeavor. Thank you so much for your work. You bet, thank you. Okay, take care, Brian. Righto.